Thank you, choir, for beautifully given. Set your course by this book here. And don't turn to the right hand, don't turn to the left hand. Let this book guide you every step of the way. Turn in your Bible now, if you will, to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Brother Marshall said it would be all right for me to make this announcement. Darlene will be going home and uh, will be taking the, under the care of hospice. And so you'll be praying for her. We're glad that she's able to go home. We were at the hospital on Wednesday evening, and I don't think our dental was mind me saying things did not look good Wednesday evening. And Thursday it was not a lot better. I walked into the hospital Friday, and Darlene was setting up in bed conducting business on the phone. And directing and saying, do this, do that, and go here and do that. And I thought, my goodness, this gal is a fighter. She really is. And you keep her in your prayers, if you will, please. Also, school is about to begin. I know all the young people are just excited about getting back to school. Amen? Not one amen from our kids. Not one. I think they've enjoyed uh, the vacation. Left to pray for everything we get set up and get ready teachers coming in and so forth, and we'll have a great year. We always begin with a little Bible. Brother Jimmy Clark will be our speaker. Many of you have heard him before. Next Sunday evening, I want to say a few words about our new property and some of the things that we're looking at for the future. There's some things that uh, we need to see uh, come about before we can really make some moves. Uh, we're still praying about the gas situation, the gas leak situation out here. We're trying to talk to families that live uh, in this area that are hooked up to wells. We'd like to see them hook up to the city so that would help us. And then there's some situations at the property that slowed us up. We're still not uh, getting real concrete uh, answers from the state as to where the corridor, 401 corridor is going to go and when it's going to take place. And so there's a lot of things to look at. And so we want to fill you in on that, Brother Johnny and Brother Drew. And, Myself will try to fill you in on just where we are and what we'd like to see happen. There are some other options, but uh, we'll try to help uh, clear a little bit of that up in your mind. We've been waiting on some things and uh, to take place. But that'll be next Sunday evening. Tonight, if you'll be back at the evening service, we're in Revelation 13 tonight. We look at the beast out of the earth. Clearly, the beast out of the sea is the Antichrist. But you come down to verse 11, and there's another beast, and the word another is of the same kind. And uh, he is the false prophet uh, that will uh, magnify uh, the Antichrist and the devil. And then, of course, the uh, mark of the beast. So I trust that you'll be here on this evening. We're in the book of 1 John. We're going to travel through the book of 1 John on Sunday morning. We've been looking at the reasons for the book of 1 John to be written. We look first of all at the fact that it's written to proper fellowship. There needs to be fellowship with the saint and the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. If there's fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then there can be fellowship one with another. You can't be wrong with God and then be right with your brother. You've got to be right with God first, then you can be right with your brother. But you can't be wrong with your brother and right with God either. Amen. And so God says, I want there to be fellowship in my church with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, then with one another. Then we looked last week at the matter of promoting joy. John wanted the people of God to have joy. He did not want them to just have joy on occasions, but he wanted them to have joy that remained. And uh, Jesus said that he had joy even while he was on the cross. Now that's the kind of joy that remains. If you have the kind of joy the Lord wants you have to have, you can have joy in the most intense suffering. You know, some Christians talk a good talk when the sun's shining. But when the clouds are rolling in and the thunder is sounding and the lightning is rolling and uh, there's uh, all kinds of floods coming in, do we have joy then? To promote joy. Now today we look at the third reason why John is writing to the, this church. And he's saying, I want to write to you to prevent sin. Look at chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, and we'll read down through chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. 
In verse 8 he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Now chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children. Now you see that phrase, little children, mentioned often in the book of 1 John. It is a term of endurance. It is an intimate term. Can you see a loving mother caressing her little daughter or son? Can you see the intimacy there? Well, this is actually the word John is using here. My little children. It's a very intimate term. I want you to have fellowship. I want you to have joy. But I want you to be saved, protected from the results of sin. Because I love you. God doesn't give us commandments because He wants to keep something from us. He gives us commandments because He wants us to protect us from the results of sin. From what sin can do in the life of a believer. And so He says, My little children. A pastor who is not warning his people about what can happen to them in their life as far as sin is concerned is not a good pastor unless he warns them about it and says stay away from these things. And so John is saying to these people, I love you and I love you so much. Listen to what I say. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There are many today who are self-deceived concerning this matter of sin. And if you listen to people talk about sin today, you hear all kinds of arguments You'll hear all kinds of reasonings. You'll hear all kinds of philosophy concerning the matter of what sin is, where it came from, etc. But there are many who are deceived. There's a man who says, I have no sin. I'm not responsible. It's my parents' fault. I'm the way I am because of my heredity. I'm the way I am because of my temperament. That's just the way I am. The society that I live in is volatile. The place I was born and where I came from, people are just hot and hot-natured and hot-tempered. And it's not my fault, it's the environment around me. It's my physical condition. That man is self-deceived. That man is headed down a path for destruction. That is a man that will not have the blessings and the goodness of God upon his life. He has the seem to have the idea, well, sin's not really that bad. It won't do any harm. Uh, after all, there are little sins and big sins and there are little white sins and so forth. And so here's an individual that just simply says, no, I don't have any sin. Here's a man that says, I have not sinned. He's deceiving himself. God says that very plainly here. Look at verse 1 again. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and of any man sin. Now what John is saying is this. Even though you are a believer, you have emotions of sin at work in your body. And there is that possibility for a believer to sin. And it's very possible. Listen carefully. For any one of us in this building this morning, even though we are saved and have God's divine nature living within us, it is possible for us to commit any kind of hideous sin that you can name. And so we're deceiving ourselves if we say, I don't sin. I don't have any sin. There is that possibility there, if any man sin, we have an advocate. What is an advocate? Uh, we'll get into that just a little bit uh, later on. These people are calling God a liar. 
Because God has said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we may sit here this morning in this church building with our fine suits and dresses. And we may go to work tomorrow to a place of position and a place of authority. And we may pay our bills. And there's no bill collector eating at our heels. There's no bill collector calling us. We're kind. We give to charity. And so we sort of have the idea, you know, I'm, I'm a very good person. But did you know that God warns us he that standeth take heed lest he fall? Because there's more dangers in this world than murder and adultery and robbery and all of the rest. There's another catalog of sins that we Christians can commit that God says are just as bad as any of these. So many times we try to protect ourselves because we say, well, I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do the other thing, but we, we're mean-spirited. We don't keep a check on our temper, on our anger, on our attitude, on our spirit. And all of these things, God is not playing games concerning the matter of sin with an unsaved man or with a saved man. And then there is the believer who can deceive himself by saying, well, uh, you know the old nature can be eradicated. I can come to a point in my life when I do not sin. For instance, look at chapter uh, 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God. By the way, you see that phrase uh, in the book of 1 John over and over again. But what does it mean to be born of God? It means that we have God's nature within us. When we repented of our sin and asked Jesus to come into our heart and save us, uh, Peter says that we are partakers of His divine nature. He goes on to say, He that is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now what does that mean? Let me tell you what it does not mean, and I'll answer the other part of it a little later on. It does not mean that there comes a time in your life or mine when we reach a point that God reaches down and takes that those motions of sin away from us and we do not sin at all. And we're deceiving ourselves if we believe that. Dr. Warren Wiersbe tells us a story of a lady walking out of a church one Sunday morning and she was upset with the preacher because he preached on sin. And she said to the preacher, you know, I, I'm just upset with you preaching on sin. After all, sin in the life of a believer is different than sin in the life of an unsaved man. And the preacher looked her right in the eye and said, yes, you're right, it's worse. He hit the nail right on the head, didn't he? So John, as a loving pastor, a loving brother, a loving disciple, wants to prevent these believers from being deceived. He wants to help them walk righteously and holy. He wants them to have a life before God that God can bless. And so he says in chapter 1, verse 8, if we say, and he's right off the bat warning us to be very careful with what we say and then what we practice. Because we can say one thing and practice another. And so he says, if we say that we have no sin or no sin nature, we deceive ourselves. And the word deceive is led into error. Now, unsaved people can be led into error, but saved people can be led into error if they do not follow strictly the Scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit of God to direct us. Now, let me say two things before I go any further. This matter of sin, there is fearful results. Fearful results, if I take it by. Fearful results unless I, with all of my heart and soul, want to walk with God. But more than that, there can be fatal results. For an unsaved man to continue in sin without receiving Christ means eternal damnation. 
in hell. But for the believer, it can mean, first of all, that God will speak to us through His Word by His Holy Spirit. And He will say to us, this is wrong, correct. How long will He be patient? How long will He be loving? I think that is up to Him, and I think it has to do with our heart and our tenderness. And by the way, that's one of the areas we need to be very careful of because if a believer will allow sin to remain in his life, it can lead us to a point where we get very hard and very callous and very cold. And so we're being warned to listen to God when He speaks. By the way, if I have sin in my life, if you have sin in your life, and the Spirit of God reminds us of it through the Word of God, the sooner I give attention to that, sin and ask forgiveness and move along the much much better it is for me much better it is for you David and his sin went had at least two years Bible scholars believe before he did anything about it and there were fearful consequences there's the chastening of the Lord that will come to us and then we'll see in just a little bit that there's even something far worse than that. So let's put down today some things concerning this matter of sin and uh, John writing to prevent sin. Number one, put down, if you will, the principle of sin. The principle of sin. Again, he says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about original sin. Original <laughs> sin. What is original sin? It is a condition from which the committing of sins proceeds. Man sins because he's a sinner. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I love that old song. Thank God for His grace. And thank God for His mercy. And you and I were pulled, and we're saved today, are pulled and dug out of and rescued from the pit of sin. A horrible, wicked fact of evil and vileness that you and I could never really understand fully. And the evil that, is, that He pulled us from. And He did it because He loved us. And did it because of His grace. And did it because of His mercy. Thank God for His grace. The only thing that will set you free. And the only thing that will carry you to heaven. And not a one of us will walk the streets of gold one day waving a white flag and saying, I made it on my own. We'll walk down the streets of gold saying, singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And unless you're willing to admit that you're a wretch and that from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet is nothing but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, you will never enter into the gates of that celestial city. And so he says, I want you to understand that there is a principle when it comes to this matter of sin. Man is a sinner. Turn back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want you to look at a few verses there. The Apostle Paul is describing this very same thing. Look at verse 12. Romans 5 and verse 12. Wherefore is by one man... Now let me stop there. It is Eve that Satan came to. It is Eve of whom this serpent spoke to. But Adam was there. Adam, where were you? What were you doing? And yet the Bible says by one man sin entered into the world because Adam was the federal head of the race. It was Adam's responsibility to speak up and say, get away. Don't listen to him. Don't talk to him. Don't converse with him. Don't argue with him. Don't debate with him. Get away. Adam did not do so. And so God says, I hold 
Adam accountable as the federal head of the race. And because he sinned, the Bible says, watch now, that sin entered into the world. And here it's the world of men. The world of the human race. And now watch. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. From Adam to his children, from their children to their children, from their children to their children, from their children to their children, until this very day, until the day that God takes all of us home to heaven, sin passed from one generation to another. Look at verse 17 of Romans chapter 5. For if by one man's offense death reigned, the word reign there is exercise kingly power. God said to Adam, you have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air. You have dominion. Now, Adam, you reign over this earth. You have kingly authority and power over this earth. Adam had a choice of saying no to sin and yes to God. But Adam said yes to sin and no to God. And so as a result of that, through his offense, death reigned. That's why humanity, from that time until now, is under the blight of sin. By one, much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I don't have to remain under the power of sin, the authority of sin, the kingly reign of sin, because there was someone who paid my debt on Calvary's cross. Thank God. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made. That is, the whole human race, sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now we know that sin is a transgression of the law. As a result of the original sin, mankind is lost. That's why you see what you see in the world today. And things aren't getting better, it's getting worse. Look at the practice of evil openly all around you. I don't have to get into that. Sin is against everything that is righteous. Anything that is right and good according to God's standard, sin is against. How can we make it any plainer? It's awful. It's terrible. Stay away from it. Now, verse 8 again of chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, again, we go back to the original, we go back to the nature of sin that came upon us as a result of Adam. This sin can never be eradicated in this life. I want you to get that. I want you to understand that. So now you say, well, preacher, if that's true, what happened when God saved me? Where am I now? What has happened now since God has saved me? The Christian is no longer in sin. But watch it. Sin is in us. Now what do I mean by that? When I got saved, God gave me His divine nature. But in this Bible, Paul said it, in the book of Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, he said it. He said the motions of sin still work in this body. Now watch. Even though the old nature can never be eradicated, even though the motions of sin still work, you know what happened when Jesus died for me and rose again and I became a believer in Him? I am no longer a slave to sin's kingly authority. Now listen here. 
We all have a besetting sin, every one of us. But you know something? Through the power of God, we've been set free from that and we do not have to bow down to sin. Now, it has a continuous influence on us as long as we're in this flesh. I have been saved from the power of sin. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. And one day I'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Won't that be a great thing? But right now, you see what happened in Adam is there was an action in the completed in the past that has present results. But no longer do we have to be a servant to that sin. Put down number two, the prohibition for sin. We've established the fact that man is a sinner. We've established the fact that even though we're believers, the motions of sin still work in our life. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write out unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Look back at chapter uh, the book of John, chapter 15, verse 16. The book of John, chapter 15, and verse 16. And there are many other verses, but I want you to see this one. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Now watch this. And that your fruit should remain. God doesn't want us to lose anything that we have accomplished in Christ. He wants us to abide in Him. Now watch. To abide means continuous habitual action. How do I get the victory over my besetting sin? Is it temporal? Is it unforgiveness? Is it gossip? Is it selfishness? Is it pride? What is it? The motions of sin are working. But I don't have to bow down. I don't have to bow down to it. Kingly rule. So what's the answer? Abiding in Christ. Amen. To continually, habitually stay in His Word, filled with the Holy Spirit, my eyes fixed on Him. Because you see, if we continually, habitually abide in Him, we will not, listen, continually practice sin. I'm so glad for that. Now I'm going to give a caution here. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7. The book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. In Matthew 7, 21 and 22, notice that the practice of sin excludes any professed knowledge of Christ. Look at verse 21 and 22. Of Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, the Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? Verse 23 says, And I'll profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now listen here. To continually practice sin is proof positive that we've never had God's nature in place with us. Are you listening to me? A man or a woman says, I'm saved, but he just continually, she continually lives like the world. Sin continues to operate in their life, but they say, I'm saved. According to the Bible, they're lying. Because a true believer will not practice habitually practice sin, but has a desire to abide in Christ. Now, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Here's something exciting to me. I want to get back to this verse. 
Chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now I want you to think about something. The divine nature in every believer is just like the divine nature that is in Jesus. Now chew on that for a moment. Because of God's grace and mercy, when He saved us, He gave us His divine nature. The same nature that was in Jesus. What a thrilling thought. Now, there are those who use this verse and they'll say, see that? That's proof positive that a believer can come to a point where he doesn't sin. No, that's not what that verse is saying. What that verse is saying is is that new nature that is just like Christ's nature in us never sins. So what part of us sins? The motions of sin that's at work in our body. But when we abide in Christ, we have victory even over these. You see, Jesus could never have sinned because He only had one nature. Now, He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Remember what Jesus said, the wicked one cometh and hath nothing in me. You know what He's saying? There's nothing in my nature that the devil can take hold of. Now there's something in my nature, this flesh, that the devil can take hold of. That's why sometimes you see Christians acting just like an unsaved man. That's why sometimes you and I will look at ourselves and we'll say, I just can't believe I did that. I just can't believe I did that. We fail to abide in Christ. We fail to remain. We fail to remember that we're born of God. Let's come to number three and let's look at the provision for sin. Again, verse one and verse two. My little children, these things write out unto you that you sin not. I don't want you to practice sin. I don't want sin to have dominion over you. And if any man sin, you know what he's saying? I don't want you to, and you don't have to bow down to the devil, but it is possible and and it's probable that you will because of the motions of sin. So when you do, what is our recourse? What happens? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What is an advocate? An advocate is a legal representative. Now watch. I sin today. The Spirit convicts me through the Word of God that I'm wrong. The devil comes to me and says, look at what you've done. Awful, terrible. You've done it now. You've blown it. There's nothing you can do about it. Wait a minute, devil. I've got a legal advocate. You know who he is? Take that up with Jesus. Jesus says... Yes, he sinned, but I died for him. I rose again for him. And I can forgive him because I have paid the penalty. That will cause even a Baptist to shout. Or at least get a smile out of him. Look at verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sin. The word propitiation has an idea of a means of appeasing. But it really means more than that. It means that when we sin and we're convicted of our sin and we're sorry for our sin, we go to the Heavenly Father, we ask for forgiveness, and we're forgiven. I guess I need to go back to verse 9 and verse 10 again. If we confess. The word confession simply means what God does for us outwardly. Watch now. Name any sin you want to. Name any sin you want to. That person is convinced.
convicted, that person goes to God and asks forgiveness. And you know what happened? God forgives him outwardly. He doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Now with people he will. Because people doesn't forgive and forget the way God does. People hold grudges. Sometimes people like to see others fail because it makes them feel better. But the Lord forgives us outwardly. But then in verse 1 also He says, not only will I forgive you, but I am faithful and just to forgive you of our sins and to cleanse. And the word cleanse is what God does on the inside. So I am clean on the inside. I am forgiven on the outside. It doesn't get any better than that. Amen? Now wait a minute, I want to abide in Christ. I don't want to sin. I want to please my Heavenly Father. But if I do, I have legal counsel. And I can be forgiven outwardly and cleansed inwardly. You see, this legal aid is capable of giving aid and capable of giving legal advice. Someone said, our Lord on the cross provided an atonement for the penalty of sin and satisfaction for God's broken law. And it's all through Him. But now let's come to the last thing. And I really hate to end on a negative, but I think I can turn it into a positive. Look at the penalty for sin. Look at chapter 5, verse 16 of 1 John. If any man see a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now this is not the unpardonable sin. There is an unpardonable sin that has been committed in every age. This is not an unpardonable sin. This has to do with the belief. And to make it just as simple as I can, this passage is written to a child of God and it is a state of sinning of which the believer continues in. There might be remorse at first, but the more he is involved in it, the less his conscience bothers him, and there is the possibility of premature death. Paul said some will be saved yet as though by fire. And it is possible, according to 1 Corinthians 11, for believers to be sick and sleeping because they will not deal with their sin. Let me close by asking you to turn to John 15. John chapter 15. I am the true vine, my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You see, God saved us to produce fruit. God saved us to glorify Him. And when we come to that point where we're not bearing fruit and we're not glorifying Him, there is that danger of being taken to heaven prematurely. And every branch that beareth fruit, He purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Look at verse 4. Abide in me. See, there you are. How do you continue to bear fruit? How do you continue to stay away from sin? Abiding in Him. <laughs> As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. What did Paul say? There will be at the judgment seat those who have gold, silver, and precious stones. But there will be at the judgment seat also those who have wood, hay, stone. The 
wood, hay, stubble is going to be burned up. John, why are you writing? I want our people to have fellowship. I want God's people to have joy. I want our people to be saved from what sin can do in their life. I'm writing to prevent sin. And my goal this morning is to say sin is an awful, terrible thing. But hallelujah, we have a Savior who can forgive us and set us free. And set our feet upon a rock and establish our going and can use us mightily for His glory. And next week we'll look at forgiveness. And if He's forgiven me, then I will forgive others. Now, where am I in my Christian life today? Am I moving forward and producing much fruit? Or am I allowing sin to come in and tear down the things that God wants to do? Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? If you'll stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, brother, wool lines going to come and lead our choir in a song of invitation. I'm going to be standing here at the front. Here's the invitation today. First,